Okay, here we go. Yes, the Bible does mention unicorns, but is the same description within the Webster's New World Dictionary the same description uh, that we see within the Bible concerning unicorns? Let's find out. According to Webster's New World Dictionary, 4th edition, the term unicorn means a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn growing from its forehead. Now, when people read verses with this term in it, and they think of this mythical horse with a single horn growing from its forehead, they are committing a very common uh, mistake called subjective interpretation. Instead of exegeting the text, which means to extract the meaning from the text, the reader uh, uses the opposite approach. And this is called eisegesis, which means to interpret a passage subjectively. The word eisegesis literally means uh, to lead into, which means the interpreter interjects his or her own ideas onto the text, making it mean whatever they want it to mean. This, of course, often leads to unnecessary misinterpretations. For example, um, go to the next bus stop and catch the bus. Now, obviously, this statement doesn't mean that the reader or the listener should attempt to go to the next bus stop and literally try to catch the bus. That's not what that means. However, that's exactly how many people read into writings of many authors. The proper interpretation of this statement means to travel to the next bus stop, then make access onto the bus. So with, with everything we read, we have to try our best to discover the proper context or meaning of what has been stated. J.C. Ryle said, ignorance of scripture is the root of every error in religion and the source of every heresy. To be allowed to remove a few grains of ignorance and to throw a few rays of light on God's precious word is in my opinion, the greatest honor that can be put on a Christian. When it comes to the unicorn topic in the Bible, there's a gentleman on YouTube uh, who's put together a, a, what I would consider a really good uh, explainer video about this topic. His name is Nathan. I don't, I don't remember the extension for his YouTube page, but we'll put it in the, in the um, description box below. Now, I think he does a great job explaining why so many people get this topic completely wrong when they read uh, uh, the areas in the Old Testament where the term unicorn is there. So um, just take some time and check it out. Why does the Bible mention unicorns? If you look up the word unicorn in the Webster's New World Dictionary, it says that unicorn is a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn growing from its forehead. This is a depiction of a unicorn. This animal is mythical. It's fictional. It's make-believe. It's not real. There's none of these alive today, and no scientist has ever found a fossil of one, and yet unicorns are mentioned in the Bible nine times in the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Job, Psalms, and Isaiah. And so because of this, people like to scoff at the Bible and say things like this. So, now if you believe in God, you believe in unicorns. Which is fantastic. If we're going to use the Bible for science, we've got some tough things to explain. What are you going, what are you going to do about uh, unicorns? Or mentioned eight times in the Bible. I want to tell you what, we have never found a fossil of a unicorn. By the way, where are the unicorns that are referred to in the Bible? Where, where are those, either in the fossil record or today? I'd like to see one of those. Another one of those interesting tests that continues to get failed. Well, if you get an old 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, which is the very first edition dictionary that Webster came out with about 200 years ago, and if you look up the word unicorn, it says that unicorn is an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. Notice how this definition says absolutely nothing about a horse. It says nothing about a horse-like animal or a mythical animal or a fictitious creature. It says absolutely nothing about Greek mythology whatsoever, but rather it says that this is a name that is often applied to the rhinoceros. Wait a minute. What? The rhinoceros? You mean this is a unicorn? But the rhinoceros has two horns. How could this be a unicorn? 
Well, if you look up the word rhinoceros in the same dictionary, it says that rhinoceros is a genus of quadrupeds of two species, one of which, the unicorn, has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal, when full-grown, is said to be 12 feet in length. There is another species with two horns, the bicornus. They are natives of Asia and of Africa. According to Noah Webster, back in the early 1800s, it was understood that there were two species of the rhinoceros. The one-horned species was called unicorn, and then the two-horned species was called bicornus. So basically, you get a 200-year-old Noah Webster's Dictionary, and look up the word unicorn, it says rhinoceros, then look up the word rhinoceros, and it says unicorn. That was just 200 years ago. The Old King James was translated 400 years ago, in 1611. So if the definition of the word unicorn has changed in just the past 200 years from rhinoceros to horse, then it doesn't make much sense to take a modern definition of the word unicorn and apply it to a 400-year-old translation of the Bible. That's illogical. As a matter of fact, even today, the scientific name of the Asian one-horned rhinoceros is Rhinoceros unicornis, and Deuceros bicornis is the scientific name of a two-horned rhinoceros. Well, where do you think those scientific names came from? Hmm, I wonder. Well, they came from the Latin. Unicornis and bicornis are Latin words. Well, that's interesting, because in Psalm 92, verse 10, the psalmist is praying and says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. If you look up this verse in the Latin Bible, the word that's being used here is the word unicornis. Unicornis is the same Latin word that's being used in the scientific name of the Asian one-horned rhinoceros. In Job 39 verse 9, God is speaking to Job and says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? If you look up this verse in the Latin Bible, the word that's being used here is the word rhinoceros. Rhinoceros is the Latin word that's being used in this scripture verse. Interesting. Rhinoceros unicornis. Rhinoceros unicornis. As a matter of fact, in these nine scripture verses, there's actually five different Latin words that are being used. Rhinoceros, rhinocerotis, rhinocerata, unicornium, and unicornis. These five Latin words are what's being used when the old King James version of the Bible says unicorn. Here's a book that was published in 2003 called The Return of the Unicorns, The Natural History and Conservation of the Greater One-Horned Rhinoceros. On the front cover of this book, there's a picture of some rhinoceros. And this book is called The Return of the Unicorns. This book was published in 2003. You can buy it on Amazon.com for 10 bucks. Here's a creature which scientists today refer to as the giant unicorn. It's an extinct species of a giant one-horned rhinoceros called Elasmotherium sibiricum. And scientists today call it the giant unicorn. As a matter of fact, this is the creature which creation scientists like Ken Ham believe to be the unicorn that's being mentioned in the Bible. Ken Ham is the president of Answers in Genesis and the founder of the Creation Museum. And this is the creature which he believes to be the unicorn that's being mentioned in the Bible when God is questioning Job and says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve you? Will he stay in your stall? Can you hitch a unicorn to a plow? Or will he plow the valleys behind you? Since he's so strong, can you trust him? Or will you leave your labor to him? Can you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? The question is, though, why is it that some of the Latin verses say rhinoceros, but then others say unicornis? Well, in Psalm 92, verse 10, according to the context of the scripture, it's talking about a one-horned animal. It says phrases like, my horn, and the horn. That's why it uses the word unicornis, because it's talking about a one-horned animal. However, in Deuteronomy 33, according to the context of the scripture, it's talking about a two-horned animal. Moses is speaking here about Joseph, and he says that Joseph's horns are like the horns of unicorns. And then he goes on to say, they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Basically, Moses is saying here that Joseph's two horns are Joseph's two sons. Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's two sons. You see, in the King James Bible, when it says unicorns plural with an S, there's actually a marginal note. And if you look up that marginal note, it says that in the Hebrew, it's actually a unicorn singular. In the Hebrew text, the word being translated unicorn is singular, but the word being translated horns is actually plural possessive. So it's basically saying that these plural horns are being possessed by this singular unicorn, which would mean that it's not actually a unicorn. That's why the verse in Latin doesn't say unicornis, but rather it says rhinoceros, talking about the two-horned rhinoceros, which actually makes perfect sense, because the two-horned rhinoceros has a larger horn, and it has a smaller horn. 
You see, back in Genesis 48, Jacob prophesied that Ephraim would be greater than Manasseh. He said that Manasseh shall be great, but that Ephraim shall be greater. He said that Manasseh shall become a people, but that Ephraim shall become a multitude of nations. And then later on in Deuteronomy 33, Moses is confirming that Ephraim really is greater than Manasseh, because he says, the ten thousands of Ephraim, but the thousands of Manasseh. He's saying that Ephraim consists of tens of thousands of people, but Manasseh only has thousands of people, thus confirming that Jacob's prophecy really did come true. Ephraim really is greater than Manasseh, just like Jacob prophesied. And in order to paint a picture of who Joseph is, he says that Joseph's horns are like the horns of the rhinoceros, the two-horned rhinoceros, which has a larger horn and a smaller horn, the larger horn being Ephraim and the smaller horn being Manasseh. So it is true that the old King James version of the Bible has a mistake in it, but the mistake is not that it mentions a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn on its head. The mistake is that it mentions a one-horned rhinoceros when some scripture verses, according to the context, are actually talking about a two-horned rhinoceros. Now while Nathan's answers may not satisfy you entirely, uh, you have to admit that these are reasonable explanations for why the term unicorn is mentioned in the Bible. The next time you sit down to, to read or to study the Bible, check out Dr. Rebecca Idestrom's Exegesis Guidelines. We've attached a link below in, in the description box. Until next time, strive to be a critical thinker, get ignited for the gospel, and evangelize in Jesus' name. God bless you all. We